Alright guys, so we're going to start this build by ripping down some aluminum that I bought. Um, I bought this piece in this size to make it cheaper instead of having it cut. And so I'm cutting it with the uh, circular saw in order to bring it down. Um, this video is obviously going to be based on the title about the build of my 5-axis, technically a 6-axis CNC machine. Um, it's a head-head, two uh, axes in the head, and then there's going to be another axis on the table. Um, you don't see a lot of head head machines. So, uh, this is, there's one other that I know about mock super. He did it and I've actually talked to him. Um, as far as I know, he's the only one who's really done one on YouTube. Um, so this kind of amateur isk project, um, it's kind of cool. So, uh, here, what you see me doing is, um, I'm just adding some stiffening to the, um, back of my, uh, machine. This was a machine I built out of a kit. Um, and I'm just adding these L channels to give it a little bit of, uh, torsional stiffness in the back. Um, try to get a little bit more performance out of the machine since uh, by adding the head head to the um, to the machine, I'm going to um, increase the moment arm. And so I was potentially making the uh, risk of chatter and stuff like that worse by um, doing that. So I wanted to make the machine a little bit more rigid. And you're going to see me use this method quite a bit. Um, the blue tape and painter's tape and super glue method. Um, this kind of came around from Saunders Machine Works, I believe. He may not have been the first person, but he kind of made it a little bit famous on YouTube. Uh, packaged it in a nice thing, and a lot of people learned about it. He may have come up with it. I'm not actually sure. Um, but you see it quite a bit. Um, and it does work really good for one-off kind of things and um, for being able to machine all the way around a come uh, a part that you're making. Um, so I have a whole bunch of parts nested together like this. It really works. Um, and I've used this a lot, particularly on parts for my machine, for whatever reason, that's a way I've gotten a lot of the, um, I built the vices on my machine. I built a lot of other stuff for my machine using this particular method and it works pretty well. So I always start off by gluing it down and then facing it. Um, you could technically put it in a vise to do the facing, but that introduces warp and stuff. Um, I guess I could have put it in advice, but I was using this method. Um, the only kind of downside to this work holding, other than the fact that it takes a lot of time um, and you know uses quite a bit of consumables, is that uh, it's difficult to get off the bed, as you can see there a second ago. So I always clean it with acetone, get everything nice and clean before I put the tape down. I clean everything with acetone, honestly. If acetone causes cancer, I'm uh, going to have cancer. It is kind of satisfying to watch this stuff go down. And then I always use a burnishing tool to make sure it's really stuck down because you do want good work holding strength out of what you're doing. And this stuff really does hold on very tightly. I mean, you can machine on legit machines that are putting a lot of torque into your parts and they'll hold on with this method if they have enough surface area. Can't do it on a really small part, but um, these things are really on there. Um, so this is the last operation on this. I obviously can't film everything because the machine's not open all the time, but I try to get uh, video of at least some of the interesting parts for you guys. So this is the last operation. It's a 2D contour. Um, cutting the parts free and uh, this is actually a finishing pass so I, I cut around the, the parts with a little bit of um, offset and then I come back in and finish the uh, the walls and this is just a time lapse of that same operation um, it takes a long time I have to stand there and blow it off with an air gun so that the it doesn't clog um, the end mill with chips Here we are back to popping the thing off. Um, it does mar the parts very slightly. So if you have a part that really needs to be perfect, this might not be a good operation for you. You might want to come up with something else or you might need to, might need to figure out another way to get the parts off the bed. Um, you can heat them up um, and that'll cause the super glue to give up. But you got to get it pretty hot and you're making your machine pretty hot. So I don't really love that. And like I said, I did this a bunch.
This is kind of a weird facing operation. I probably wouldn't do this again because it wasn't super even. I went with an adaptive facing because it was so large, but I should have just done a normally straight across the top facing operation. It would have been more consistent. Not too much of a problem though. Burnishing again here. That burnishing tool, I was really careful to chamfer it and make sure there was no sharp edge so that the corners on that is kind of rounded so that I can't accidentally gouge up the uh, tape and, and make a raised portion. It's just made out of a piece of round stock too, half inch round stock, piece of steel. Back to the super glue. This does use a lot of super glue too, and a lot of tape, and a lot of time. But it keeps the parts really flat, and then holds them really well, and you can machine all the way around them. And then, uh, I didn't show this before, but I like to put a bunch of heavy stuff on it to help it kind of seat down and get a good adhesion. Here I am, this is on a lapping, or this is on a piece of granite, I'm lapping it on a piece of granite. I always put a piece of aluminum down. Aluminum has a, uh, aluminum foil has very consistent thickness. And it keeps a uh, abrasive grit from getting on my um, surface plate and ruining the flatness. And I just do that just to kind of make them a little bit more precise. They don't have, it's probably not necessarily needed, but I like to just kind of clean them up a little bit. So we've just done a facing up, popping that guy off, and then doing the same thing again. More glue, more weights, more facing. Now we're doing some of the small features, and then we're doing some of the larger features. It's a time lapse through the outside of the uh, machine. This is from the outside. This is where I have to spray it down to keep the chips from clogging the end mill. Now we're on to another plate. I had a par couple parts, um, which I didn't actually end up using in the final design, so I made these but didn't use them. But they were made out of a thinner piece of stock. That other piece, I believe, was three quarters. Here I am doing a bunch of deburring. Do a lot of deburring um, when doing machining. I actually kind of enjoy deburring. I'm not sure why. Um, I always deburr all my holes too, just with a chamfer bit in my drill. I want to make a hand deburr tool with the offset handle that you can rotate around. Those are really cool. Um, I'll have to do that at some point. And the parts I can't get with the deburr tools, I use a file. I'm fairly meticulous when I build stuff. I like to make things have a nice finish and fit. And then I always pilot, on my machine, I always pilot um, all my holes with an eighth inch bit. Um, and then if they're smaller than eight inches, I usually just put a spot and then I come back and I use the drills that I need to get the right size hole. So I don't do any of the actual two size drilling unless it happens to be an um, eighth inch hole. And even then I usually don't go all the way through because it takes a long time on my machine. And I drill them all out uh, on my drill press there. So now you'll see this drilling. Um, if you look, you can, might be able to tell I'm not really going all the way through the parts. I'm just uh, spotting, um, starting. And sometimes I'll start fairly deep because I want a, a good pilot, but I don't go all the way through usually. In some cases I do. If I have a very specific depth I'm trying to hit, like I am right now, I will go down to that depth. And then I'm using an end mill for that precise uh, spot to uh, clean up those holes because I needed those holes to be a very specific diameter, which is a quarter inch because those are going to be pinned together. So if I do need a specific size hole, I'll use an end mill and I'll interpolate it out um, instead of drilling it or reaming it or anything like that. Um, it's just easier since I have a collet system uh, to do that because... You can't fit every size bit in a collet system, um, and it's expensive to go buy, you know, ground tools that are specific shank sizes for the um, the collets that I have. That right there, I was showing you probing. I just wanted to show you that, show you how I did it. And there I am doing more interpolation of those holes there. More holes. Doing some brake press and shear work. 
I think just shearing Ashley on this part. I'm making a little cover for some of the um, bearings inside the A axis. And I always take a lot of top passes on parts like this because I found when working with um, thin sheet metal, it likes to get grabbed and pulled up into the end mill. So I take a lot of passes to get that, that done on thin stock like that. Uh, here I am. I think I'm starting to do tapping now. Um, I might be doing widening some holes, I think. There, and then now I'm just cleaning up those uh, covers. Kind of bouncing around because I have machines running and lots of parts to do, so I bounce around to different parts that need work. And then there's always some hand sanding that occurs as well. Um, and you'd be surprised how much this is done in like actual industry. I worked at a aerospace machine shop and we made parts for planes and rockets and all kinds of stuff. And every single one of those parts were had some amount of hand finishing on them. And like I said, I had spotted those um, on the machine and now I'm just drilling them out by hand. These are smaller than eighth inch bits because they're for full 40s. I'm just doing the countersunk because these are countersunk bolts by hand because of how small they are. And I'm starting some tapping. And, uh, well, you'll see. Getting a little confident using the drill with the tap. And there it is. So I broke a tap off. So there's one dead tap in my machine and I think it was just one. So that's actually pretty successful. My Iron Man suit has six or seven broken taps in it. So. This right here is a thing I machined up to a jig to try to get a precise hole alignment on the holes on the outside. Um, corner of this and you see I had to heat it up to get it on there which worked pretty well um, it wasn't the most precise way to do that um, so unfortunately it didn't work super well but the machine ended up coming in fairly accurately so and then now since I've already broken a tap I'm doing rest of the taps by hand for sure um, using a lot of tapping fluid and uh, man a lot of taps I hate tapping <laughs> Seems like when I do projects like this, it's 90% tapping. Looks like I got one more piece to machine up here. Uh, we're doing the other side of that flat piece that I did earlier. I needed an angle on this part. Like I said, I didn't end up using this part, but I'm showing it anyway. Um, this is a interpolation, um, simultaneous three axis machining, making that angle there. It worked pretty well. When you use a flat end mill, it doesn't give a great surface finish. But I need a flat end mill to get all the way to the bottom. So, And surface finish isn't as important as precision, really. And then some of these parts needed machining on the back sides after they were cut free. So that's what you're seeing here. That little cutout is for um, an end stop. And then just doing some lathing here. There's quite a bit of lathing on this project as well. It's a really fun project. It was a lot. It kind of pushed my machining skills a little bit. Um, this is me dialing this in. I'm trying to be very precise because I'm about to machine in some uh, geometry into this lathe piece. So I was just getting it super flat is what I was doing. So now we're on the other side and I'm machining in a uh, locating fixture to keep this part from twisting. Um, so what we're machining here is the rotary axis for the C axis, the table axis, and that's what these other parts are as well. And there's the other side. And this is another piece that was lathed and then machined. Or this part may have just been machined. Um, been a while since I've done this. But uh, these parts, like I said, are all going... Um, they're the part that's actually being rotated. And then there's also uh, mounting holes and threads for the uh, table axis, the C axis. Which I've also called the fourth axis in this um, video. 
and that's because uh, it kind of operates like you would imagine a typical fourth axis that would just go on top of your table that you would buy something for like a Tormach. That's kind of what I was building with this. But it does work in conjunction with um, the B axis on the head, so it's, you know, together it really is a fifth, fifth axis machine, but I'll call it the fourth axis. I'll call it the table axis, and I'll call it the C axis, so. And now I have two parts that were machined independently, and then I'm machining them together to get a, a good face on them. I believe that's what was occurring. And then doing some threads on that same part. You see I have a thread block there to try to get my threads as straight as possible. And that just aligns my tap um, or tap block. It, it aligns my tap to the part that I'm cutting the thread in. Here I am making some alignment pins for the two parts that are machined to fit together. That This is how I did uh, the machine for the most part. And since, you know, you can't make the, such a large part on a small machine, I had to make the machines out of smaller parts and then um, put them together. And in order to get them to go together in a precise way, they needed to be held together in some kind of precise way. So I used alignment pins to do that. Um, and that's where you saw me interpolating those holes uh, that were quarter inch, that's for those pins. I ended up cutting those pins, as you saw. Um, turns out you could just buy pins that are of length on my master card. Um, I should have done that. That's what I would have done in the future. Just didn't think of it at the time. More lathing, and you can hear the CNC running in the background. Um, I like to get stuff done, so I'm, op I'm often operating multiple machines at once. I feel good when I'm doing it that way. And manual lathe work is, you know, a lot of measuring and checking. It's not as easy as CNC machining, but it's a little bit more rewarding, I would say. I really enjoy watching the swarf build up on this saw. Something satisfying about that. So here we're gonna do the other side of that locating fi fixture you saw earlier. So this is the back cap for that fixture. It was very quick, I know, but um, it was essentially a hex that fits together and the screw holds from the back. And so I didn't, I needed those not to unscrew. So I needed a fixture to keep it from twisting. Um, it did end up having a little bit of backlash in it cause it wasn't a very tight fit. So I ended up having to put a little bit of epoxy in there but it did work. With the epoxy it worked. And here I am tapping that um, screw for that same part um, that holds the two together. And you'll see it later when it starts to come together. There's the front side of that. And there's, a, as you can see, there's a bunch of mounting holes in, uh, for pins and a bunch of holes for, or a bunch of threaded holes to mount. Here I am adding, um, this is a new thing I've done on this particular project. I'm adding a uh, uh, washer or, um, wiper to keep chips out of the uh, bearing. And I 3D printed those on my resin um, printer um, out of some flexible resin. And they actually worked pretty well. I was pretty happy with that. And I cut in that small groove earlier, which you saw, using the UV light to cure them together. Um, and the reason for that is uh, I couldn't print the full thing on my machine. It was too small. And then this is an FDM print and I'm using these zip ties to hold this print together. Um, this is the gear for driving the, um, uh, the machine. So I'm using the zip ties to hold it together as I um, hammer it onto the uh, aluminum that keeps it from breaking. Ended up having to take all this stuff off um, because it didn't work, as you'll see later. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the process worked. Um, so now that I have that washer made, um, now I'm gluing it into position. Like I said, I'm kind of doing things in an odd order here, but you can tell I already have that uh, gear reduction already stamped on there. So before I was gluing the two sides together and now I'm gluing it in. And then now I'm adding the bearings. Um, and I ended up having to take this bearing off as you'll see in a second. Um, but uh, there I am doing a, a fit to get everything together there. And there you can see is kind of the function so that that outer bearing is a thrust bearing, and then there's an inner um, ball bearing. 
What's up guys? Uh, I know I haven't talked to the camera yet until just now, but we'll see if this makes it into the video, but I was just sitting here and oh. <laughs> So what I was talking about is um, I can't remember the exact reason to be honest with you why I had to take these that center bearing off that uh, ball bearing so I, I Fixed up this jig to yank it off and that works. Um, I ruined the bearing but I couldn't get something underneath the bearing because I made a bad design choice, which was um, not having a step underneath the ball bearing. So I couldn't get anything underneath it. So I had to make that tool. So now, so I have a step. I'm here building um, little washers to put underneath the uh, underneath the bearing so that if I did have to take them off again, which I didn't, um, I could get something underneath them and lift them up that way. Here, I'm. Uh, this is the part that holds the spindle, and so I'm machining this on the lathe. For stars, it was a little undersized, but then by doing this on the lathe, it makes it really concentric and round and really gives me good grasp onto the uh, the spindle. This is drilling a hole for um, the spindle nut that holds the, uh, the, the spindle on. So that nut goes on there and tightens them together. And the last operation is to cut um, the flexor piece out so that it can grab onto the spindle. And here's a uh, montage, um, a bit quiet, I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, it goes together. So this is me putting uh, all the parts together um, slowly. I believe I get the entire head together in this, uh, this shot, I believe. Putting in all the bearings, yep, there we go. Uh, using my granite and my uh, one, two, three blocks, trying to get everything as square as possible. Ended up having to take that all apart again, so it's kind of a just an exercise really, but it works. Uh, making an angle. Um, can't remember exactly where this goes, but uh, you can see I oversized it a little bit. I'm just using a square to get it get it right. I said oversized. I meant overbent. Uh, here we are putting the um, electrical box together. I ended up reusing the electrical box, and it was crowded in there. I really should have made another box. Um, but once I started, I didn't feel like stopping. Um, it did all fit, and it's very compact, but it's also a mess. <laughs> Um, so I'm, that's the old uh, control board I'm taking off right there, and I'm going to be putting in a new control board. I've got um, six stepper motor drivers instead of three in there now. Um, just a lot of wiring and reading diagrams. It's really not hard to do. It's just kind of uh, tedious. It's kind of fun, though. It's kind of like Lego. Uh, getting that hole drilled for a new fan because I wanted to have enough cooling in there was very hard. That hole saw did not want to work. It took a long time. Doing a little soldering here on the connections for, I think, motors in this case. Um, so I'm using these, uh, I think they're called aircraft connectors. Um, they're good. I like these. Um, I would use them again on, on a project. Um, so just soldering them up. I've done a lot of work on my shop in the interim. I made one of the things I did is make an electrical station. So this is all a lot neater now in my shop. This little box with handles that sits on my desk. It's very nice. And um, there's two reasons to twist wires together. Um, I guess three reasons. One is it looks nice. Um, two is it's more organized. Um, so the two I'm I'm twisting together are like the pool wires, and then I'll do, also do like the direction wires. And then lastly, like the main reason is for performance. It, it helps with shielding and interference. Um, though I'm not sure that's always necessary depending on, well, it's, it matters on like a low signal wire, but like on a, a high power wire, it doesn't matter as much. But I like to do this. It's satisfying. It makes everything easier to follow, um, especially when the two wires are related to each other and they're going to a similar spot on the board. So another montage here. This is me adding the motors um, and getting the pulleys on. And a lot of this does end up changing, but I'm going to go ahead and do a, a fit up here. So taking off the old spindle um, mounting system for the three axes, uh, put a little oil on the bearing, cleaning it up, and then here I am mounting the new one. So as you can see, it does hang off a lot further than the old one does. 
And that's part of the reason I wanted to add those reinforcements to the back of the machine to try to reduce the amount of issues I would run into. Hey guys, I'm here to interrupt the, adjust the camera here a little bit. I'm here to interrupt the voiceover for a second to explain a problem that I ran into. So it's gonna be a dramatic um, reenactment because I, I don't think I filmed this because I was so heartbroken when it happened. But what happened was my initial assumption of having these motors run by these um, belts would, the, the motor would be stiff enough to keep the, any wobble and play out of the machine. And while I think that actually was true from the standpoint of the stiffness of the belt, and also um, on my gear ratio, I think my gear ratio actually had enough of torque. I ran all the numbers once I realized there was a problem. And it actually, I think that it, it probably would have worked. The problem is, is there's actually play inside of motors, um, which I didn't know that until this project. But there's play, I had, I had I heard one video talk about it and I'm like, ah, it won't be a problem. And it turned out to be a giant problem. But um, that play in those motors ended up causing this to machine, not accurately, I'm looking for a test piece I had. I don't know where it went, but essentially I had, I cut some test pieces and what was happening was the tool was flexing. So right now I have, this is the unit that I got working, but I have it loosened right now to show what was happening. So what was happening is this was wobbling back and forth like this. So you can tell there's a lot of wobble and play in this. What was happening is when I was cutting around an object, the tool was bending. So when I was cutting on the outside of something, it was bending like this. And it was causing the boss, the outside, to come in oversized. And if I was cutting in on something like this, it was ro rotating around like this. And so the inside was coming in oversized. So there was flex in the machine. So that sent me on a long, long rabbit hole on how to figure this out. And the first thing I went to, so I had to figure out a gear reduction that didn't have any backlash in it. And this is the second bag of prototypes right here, of 3D printed prototypes. And this is the first bag of 3D printed prototypes right here. And that represented, I think about three months. Um, it was truly awful. Um, it was probably one of the more soul crushing things I've ever had to do um, in the standpoint of when it comes to building things. It's probably one of the most soul crushing things I've ever had to do when it comes to building things um, because it just kept not, not working. It was awful. Um, I went through a couple of different designs. I went through uh, strain wave gears, also called um, harmonic drives. I went through cycloidal drives, um, a couple different versions of cycloidal drives. I tried some other wonky versions of some drives that I found online um, and ended up, I was about to give up and buy some harmonic drives that I was, they were going to be a little too big and a little underpowered and not quite work. And then I found one other thing and I'm like, I think this might work. And I tried it and I'm going to explain that to you now. So during all this, I um, moved. So I'm in Texas now. And And that's why I'm in a different shop and you see, I've grown out a beard, which you can tell. Um, I had to paint my work table. You can tell it's yellow now um, because everything was rusting in here. Uh, it's been an emotional roller coaster, but I've gotten to a point now where I think it's working. Um, and so essentially what happens is a strain wave gear, I'll, I'll put up a little video of it, but it's, it's a flexing piece that has a different number of teeth on the inside versus the outside. And it causes it to progress very slowly based on the input rotations. Um, the problem is, is these, the flexi part was constantly breaking. No matter what I could do, I could not get it to break with the torque that I needed to deliver to my machine. Broke, 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 broke. So I came up with this thing called, they call it a Howamat. Uh, it's a German term for circulating balls, which is, they're actually not really circulating, so I don't know why they call it that. Maybe the translation's not right, but essentially what you have is you have teeth like this, and those are acting um, as the fixed spline on a harmonic drive. It'd be helpful if you know a little bit about harmonic drives, I understand this, but you don't have to. Um, essentially the outside piece that has the fixed teeth and then the flexible part is being done with these ball bearings. 
And inside of these ball bearings is a piece that looks like this. And this piece right here has a wave. Um, and what happens is when you spin it, see if I can get you to see that, the balls push up. And so these balls sliding push into the grooves of the teeth and these become what was the flex spline on a um, harmonic drive. And this thing is awesome. It has a lower reduction because um, it has three points and I'm, the reason I'm using three points is because it makes a perfect plane so there's no flex, flexing a weird thing. Um, there's nothing flexing. There's no um, compliant mechanism on this at all. So none, there's nothing like that which causes the fracture because it causes like work hardening or fatigue or whatever to set in on the material. So that's completely gone. And I'm able to use that to generate the output. So I just wanted to explain all that to you. Um, we're gonna go back to the build video now. Um, I plan to release another video about this going into a little bit more detail because I would like to do that. Um, and I also want it to be a standalone video for other people to find. But this is a really good idea and I think this works better than cycloidal and harmonic drives and those are used a lot. And, um, on YouTube, I see those a lot on YouTube and I don't think they're that good. And I have two bags of prototypes to prove that. So I wanna do another video. Hey everyone, I'm sitting here editing this video and I realize there's one other thing I should probably point out. Um, the other reason that I think these are so good uh, is they can handle higher loads. Yes, even in 3D printed parts um, and transfer those. Um, you'll see later in the video that I actually didn't use, end up using you might see later, I'm not sure I filmed it. But you'll see that I, I, I didn't actually end up using the 3D printed parts, I used machine parts. But what's cool about this design is you can machine it on a three axis CNC machine using adaptive tool pass. So you don't need a fourth axis, you don't need special tooling, you can just use a really small ball end mill um, and like a small end mill and cut out the centers. And so that is another reason I think these are super awesome is because you can make a super high zero backlash um, gear reduction um, using nothing but a three axis CNC, which is not that crazy to get your hands on something like that. So it can allow you to go build really crazy robotics without having to invest in harmonic drives. Yeah. Okay, and we're back to the voiceover. So here you can see me doing some 3D printing. This is me pulling parts off and then cleaning them. Um, dirty clean, uh, and then clean wash, and then spraying them off with uh, air and then curing them in the curing station. Um, and then there's going to be post processing on them here. Um, and this is, again, this is part for the howl mat. Um, this is after I've done all the prototypes uh, to, to get them done. So that's why I'm showing you this here. So clean them up on the lathe, um, some parts, and then the smaller parts that can't fit in the lathe. Um, the reason they have to be cleaned up in the lathe, the cleaned up here, is because it's very hard to get uh, the exact height you need on a 3D print. Um, so I print them just a little bit large, and then I machine them down. Um, and then I have all the parts, and I'm doing some assembly here, and, you know, I filmed it, and I'm showing it to you, and it's interesting, but this is not the final assembly. As I said, a lot of these, so what I did is I started off 3D printing everything, and then certain parts kept failing, um, and they needed to be made out of uh, metal, so they ended up being machined. Um, so this is the first step of that right here. Um, I'm machining some parts to uh, make some tensioners for the... Uh, the belts, one of the problems I ran into, in addition to the motors having backlash in them, is the uh, belts not being stiff enough. Um, so I put tensioners on there. So I'm essentially doing machining sort of by hands. Um, I'm obviously doing the facing and getting the height correct there on the lathe. But then you'll see a lot of the rest of this is just using a saw and using a um, hand tools and hand methods to build these little tensioners. Um, I have a prototype there on the right um, that I'm going off of and I'm building the rest of them. Um, these parts ended up not being precise enough um, and I didn't use them. I remachined them on my machine. Um, but it's an interesting process and so I decided to show it to you. Um, just using bluing and scribing and um, saws and files and you know whatever method it takes to get it done. Um, if you're really precise, um, you can make a lot of stuff with a, with a file. Um, it takes a long time, but you can do it. Um, so it's just interesting to know that you can, it's good to know that you can build stuff in a variety of ways. Um, you still need tools, don't get me wrong, but essentially this was interesting because I normally would have my CNC to do this kind of stuff, but I didn't have it at the time. I ended up kind of jerry-rigging the, uh, um, CNC machine to do these parts. I did some stuff to get it to the 
rotary axes not to move and I could use my machine as a three axis machine. That's kind of how I got this, this project over the line. Um, but I wasn't quite there at this point, so I was, I was building these parts by hand. And here, just doing some sanding. Can't tell my hands were wet, trying to keep the part cool. Doing some transfers. Um, these are little bearings, um, and then I, I machined up the shafts um, on the tensioners there. They're just The shafts are just made out of mild steel. Hopefully they don't dent up too much. It'd be nice if they were hardened steel, but they're not. Drilling out the holes. I designed the uh, the holes of the shafts that they fit into to be a drill bit that I had on hand. Or cutting, using a stick to poke these things through is a good method for doing this. More cutting. Having a saw mounted up like this, it's a Harbor Freight saw that I, it's a hand saw that I mounted and turned into a table saw. Probably one of the best tools I've ever built for myself. File sandpaper to bring everything in. Hear the crickets outside. I am in Texas, in the middle of the country. Just finessing all these parts, getting them to fit together. Um, there's a, a square nut that goes into the bottom side of these of this uh, housing, um, and then there's a screw that drives it. And so I'm putting a little dimple in that so that screw doesn't wander off. And then the screw I sharpen to a point so it sticks in that dimple. Um, and that worked well. Keep everything from twisting and moving around. Uh, the final version is a machine. It's a tighter fit, so that's less necessary. But on this, it was good to keep it from things from moving around. Here, I'm cleaning out the flashing on uh, the 3D print. I reprinted um, all these gears because I ended up using um, a new belt that had steel core um, in it, and it was poly carbonate, poly ester, something like that. There's it was a different type of plastic as well. Um, it's a much stiffer belt, so that white belt right there. But it had a different tooth pattern. I couldn't get one in the tooth pattern I needed, so I had to take the entire thing apart, pull off the uh, gear reductions, re-3D print them, refinish them, reinstall them. Um, it was quite challenging to find a belt that was the right size, too, because I had designed this for one size belt, and then I needed to add the tensioners, which made it be, need to be a different size belt and a different style of belt, so it, was, it was, took a lot of thinking to get it all figured out, but I eventually got it there. Um, I ended up putting in some threaded uh, spots for the uh, the housing to sit into the machine. And that kept things from sliding around. So here you can see I have the clamps on there. That's kind of keeping everything jerry-rigged like I talked about. So I can use this machine as a, um, as a three-axis machine. So here you see me... Uh, starting to machine the parts um, that I had just built by hand. So this is me remachining the parts that I had already built. No problem, it happens. Um, these parts come out a lot more precise, for sure. Precise and consistent. Uh, this is the one of the inner shafts. So there's an inner and outer shaft on this thing. So the um, the drive shaft is running through the inside, and then the driven shaft is running through the outside. The driven shaft was uh, under a lot of torque, um, and it needed to be made out of metal. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm making that part out of metal, out of aluminum. Uh, these are the top parts of the housings. They were also carrying a decent amount of load, so they needed to be made out of aluminum. That is the wave guide for the part. Um, here you can see me heating it up to get it off. This does work um, as well. That part was too sensitive for me to be hammering on it to get it off. Um, and then I'm machining another part there. That's the, uh, the teeth um, or your fixed spline if this were analogous to a uh, strain wave gear. 
And here's all the parts. By the way, I moved twice during this course of this video, so this is me leaving Texas. Um, I think some of that last footage was actually me in uh, New Mexico, but there's me arriving in New Mexico there. That was the machine that I've been working on being moved. It's very white and ugly on the outside. Uh, this is me just making up some pens. Um, these pens are gonna be hammered into this 3D print here. Um, that just gives give these some more uh, stiffness when they're being compressed because there's some bolts holding these things together. Um, so I wanted a little bit more rigidity here. So I came up with this idea of hammering in some uh, quarter inch rod and then having it stick out and then using the lathe to clean up those parts, um, the parts that are sticking out and then bring it into the right size too. It's a bit tedious, but it got the job done. And then this is the housing um, being machined. Uh, so I machined the side and this is called the hat. Um, this is made out of, uh, so I machine off all that top part and I'm using that, um, base as a, there it is being finished machined right there. And you can see the pockets where those square nuts right in as well. And this is the, uh, the top part, um, again for the housing. I think we had a couple of duplicates of, uh, the video in there. Uh, so I apologize for that, but, um, I made a few of these, and so I filmed things a few times. Just using a router there to clean that inside up. Uh, this is interesting. This is me making. This is a uh, homemade heat sink, um, heat shrink tooling. Um, I needed this to. Well, you need this in five-axis tooling a lot, and then I ended up needing it to do the next operation you're about to see. So I made this. Um, the concentricity of it is pretty poor, but uh, it did work. And so I needed to make a keyway onto my. Um, uh, stepper motors because the they were twisting inside of the housing the, uh, the or the inner shaft and so I needed a keyway to keep them to keep them from twisting out so I'm shooting through hardened steel here pretty cool and you can see how that um, long reach tool helped me get in there right up next to the uh, the surface there um, so here I'm making a uh, keyway again bluing just doing stuff by hand Parts are so small, a lot of sanding to bring stuff in. And there we go, checking the fit, and that fits pretty well. Pressing it in there, and there we go, we got a keyway. And this is closer to the final assembly. I ended up making three of these, right? There's one for each axis. Um, and they were all slightly different too, but they're all based on the same base design. So a lot of similar parts between them. I had to fit a very, because of the way I designed it initially, I had to sit, fit a very compact gear reduction into a very small package and that was hard. So here you can see the first attempt at me cutting this. And this is when I realized that the uh, program I'm using to run this Mach 3 is not going to work um, because it doesn't have something called tool center point control. Um, so this is after I've figured it out using Linux CNC, and I'll explain this more a little bit later, but um, I ended up getting it getting it to work. There you can see that heat shrink tooling working again. That just allows you to get a tool uh, down into somewhere a little bit deeper into a, a place uh, with less clearance. Um, but by having that shrink around it, it keeps the rigidity into the tool. If you just had a uh, eighth inch end mill that long, it wouldn't work. So here it is actually cutting. This is pretty exciting. Um, so this is actual, this is five axis machining right here. This is just a test piece that I designed and I'm cutting up to see how it runs. Um, so first we're just doing facing. And then now we'll be doing some undercuts that you could not, you couldn't do these parts, not five axis in one setup. Um, this again is just a test piece. I made a, a bunch of these and this is one of the successful ones. Ran to a bit of hookup on that last one, so I'm restarting it there. And then we'll do the front face here last. I'm spraying that with um, alcohol, and that uh, that helps aluminum machine nicely. And 
And I think we're looking at a pretty similar toolpath here. Um, just kind of showing it from another angle. You can really see the machine head moving around. It's pretty cool. It's uh, pretty neat to see it moving simultaneously, simultaneously like that. And then the last thing we're doing is a drilling operation. And this one's kind of magical because, you know, it's a hole. <laughs> so if you're off in any way, it's going to break the tool. Um, can obviously be off some, but it's it's pretty neat to see a, a hole being drilled using five axis. This was pretty neat for me to see. I was also pretty nervous, but it worked out. Get wow, that's not, I mean, obviously I'm not a precise piece of measuring equipment, but it's not terrible. I mean, it's pretty good. That was a mess up from another piece. There's a bad ball bearing in the Z-axis. But, man, I gotta say, I'm pretty fucking happy with that. That is cool. <laughs> I can't believe I five-axis machined that. That's crazy. Look, undercuts that you can never do on a three-axis machine. Wow. Holy shit. And here, um... We're machining in canal. Um, this is a really small part. That's an eighth inch in mill, so I'm pretty zoomed in there. Um, I'm taking very shallow cuts, but uh, this is a test piece for something I'm working on, and I want to see if I can machine in canal. So I am indeed machining in canal in this spot. If you know anything about in canal, it's a nickel titanium or nickel aluminum alloy. Um, it's notoriously difficult to machine. It's very hard, and I was able to do it. This is me doing some testing on the uh, the fourth axis. Um, didn't work out perfectly. I think I figured out the problem after, but it's you know at least an example of some machining. I like to show some examples of what I actually built here. A lot of video build videos on machines don't do that. Okay, so I want to talk, I want to do some talking about this um, at the end and give a little bit more uh, my final thoughts on the project at the end here. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the problems with this machine first because I think that's important to talk about in case you ever uh, try to do this yourself. Um, the first one is that um, you, the TCP control, for whatever reason, I'm not sure what the problem is, um, maybe I'll dig into it and figure it out at some point, is not working perfectly. Um, so like what happens, what TCP should do, tool center point control, um, is uh, the center of this, the center and the bottom of the tool should stay in the exact same part as the um, head moves around, either forward, which, whichever direction, whichever axis is moving. Um, and it does that, sort of, um, but it doesn't actually do it perfectly. Um, so it will actually, it's so like if, if this axis is moving here, the B axis, uh, this will move up and down slightly, and it'll move left and right slightly. So you have to go measure those things. Um, the, the, the workaround I found for that is to go measure the offset, which I'm using various means. I'm using like mostly um, uh, dial indicators um, to do it, and then, uh, and then I, I, I measure the adjustment and then I move the machine down to the position where the offset needs to be at and then I set a new work offset. So if like uh, the work coordinate offset, which is like where your work is, is like usually like G54 is the first one. I'll take it and then I'll move it to where it needs to be to be in the correct spot when it moves to the angle, so let's say 30 degrees. When it moves to 30 degrees to be in that spot, I'd make that G55. Um, and that works, and I, I did a bunch of uh, hammerheads that I'm working on. Um, so this is steel. I was cutting a bunch of steel um, on this machine, and it, it, it did work um, for the most part. I had a few crashes, which is, this is one of them, um, but it works. And so I had to, but I had to go do a 54, a 55. Actually, I was just doing two offset cuts. So I had a 54 and a 55 for both these, which was a pain in the ass. And then also these are hammerheads, so not very precise. But if you're trying to, do, the way I was doing it was not super precise. So I have some ways I could do that um, uh, using like a 3D printed, I have some ideas anyway, I have some like maybe some 3D printed jigs or something like that to where I can uh, measure the offset more accurately. Um, but it's a tricky problem um, that makes it very hard to do uh, production runs on this. Now, that doesn't mean the machine doesn't, mean the machine doesn't have value. Um, it still works well as like a prototyping machine, which is mostly what I do anyway, right? Um, so 
machine definitely has value. It's just the value is more limited than it would be if it was a uh, like able to do like production runs. Um, the other weird issue I'm getting is there is some some backlash still in the machine somewhere. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. If I knew, I might be able to fix it. But I can only dump so much of my life into this machine. Even though I do want to say I learned so much during this, and I'm, I'm glad I did it. It's just it's not. Um, I'm, yeah, so I'm glad I did it for sure. Um, it, I learned a lot. Uh, I think this gear reduction particularly is very interesting, um, and I wanted to share it with the people of YouTube to to find out about it um, because I do think it has. I do think it definitely has value. Um, again, like being on a machine it on uh, uh, a zero backlash theory, zero backlash um, machine, or zero backlash gear reduction that's uh, is high force and all that. Um, and very high reduction um, on a C on a three axis. Being able to do that on a three axis, I think, is a potentially a game changer, um, for, especially for like prototyping and stuff, where you don't want to go invest in fourth axes and really complex uh, custom cut tools and stuff for doing um, a uh, harmonic drive, which you would have to do in order to do that. This this gives you the ability to do it just like with pretty much any off the shelf machine and like a, a vice. That's really all the work holding and tooling you need, right? Um, some small end mills. Um, so anyway, this this reduction isn't quite working. So one weird thing that happens is it moves, and then the the as a that there's some sort of backlash. I tried doing it with backlash um, adjustment, and it's still not working correctly. Um, but the the tool doesn't behave in an expected way um, as you reverse directions, and it particularly it seems to do that from up, up here. It seems to do it, but when it's under the weight of the spindle hanging out, something weird is going on. So that's also so because of that. Um, this machine essentially can't do simultaneous five axis machining, which I was hoping it would, but it also is like $5,000 on Fusion 360 to do simultaneous five axis. So hey, it saves me some cash if I wanted to do that. So it's really only good for um, three plus two machining, which is fine. That's a lot of power out of that. Um, I think if I were to, I have this you know question in my mind, like what I would do this again. I think um, from like a knowledge gaining standpoint, I'm glad I did it, but the value that I got out of this, I don't think is the value that I put in if you took away the knowledge that I gathered. Um, so I don't think I would do the head of this again. Um, certainly not in this instantiation. I might potentially try to do like a five axis machine because I think there's a giant market for um, head head five axis machines, especially if you had like a steel one um, because you have this giant work surface. And even though it's not uh, that rigid of a machine, you could go buy this, like say you could sell one of these for like $10,000 or something like that, which is not an insane amount for a CNC machine. Um, you could buy it and then you could go machine complex five axis parts um, on your machine in, in like a home setting for like fairly cheap. Um, so I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, it's just this kind of fell flat of what I like, you know, exactly what I wanted it to be. Um, like I said, it's still useful, it's just not perfect, you know what I mean? Um, I think for sure, if I were to do this again, just from like the tool gaining aspect of it, I think I would probably just do the uh, fourth axis, which is right over here on the shelf. Um, because I think actually a lot of the stuff I would end up doing with this machine, um, I would I could probably figure out how to do it on just a fourth axis. Um, I think that's true. I mean, obviously this, these, this part right here, but I can make like a fixture for doing this and I could have figured out how to do this another way um, on a three axis machine. So just given the amount of time I put into it, I think I would probably just do that fourth axis because I think I would get most of the stuff that I wanted out of, out of having five axes without having to build six. <laughs> um, I think I, I, I would have probably have done that if I'd done this again. Um, Oh, one very important thing I want to say. Um, the mathematics, as you can suspect, on doing a TCP control uh, is pretty complex, and the coding is pretty complex, and I definitely did not do that. Um, the um, Mach 3 software, um, I was under the impression it would just work, um, and I ended up wasting money and time dealing with that, but it won't handle TCP at all. Um, so this is running Linux CNC, and uh, the... I don't know if it's because it's an open source community or what, but the people there were so helpful and so friendly. The software that this is running on was literally some stranger named Sierra, and I put his name right up here because this machine would not be running if it wasn't for him. Um, literally wrote the software that this is running on. I mean, I was like 
I was more like a like a tech assistant or something like that. I mean, I was communicating with them every day on the forum, and I will post a forum link below. Um, if you do decide to do something like this, you can go check out that link, and it has pretty much all of our communication between me and Mo this guy did a lot of it, but there's a bunch of other very helpful people on that um, forum as well. And this would not be running if it wasn't for him. So um, <laughs> uh, Linux CNC has a disgusting UI, but it's other than that, it's um, really a pretty awesome software, and I like highly recommend it if you're going to do something like this. Um, I wouldn't use anything else. Uh, I know there's some other more refined things, but I still I don't think I would. I, it, and learning how to do like the basics of the, the setting up a machine is not that hard. Um, and again, because the community is so open and helpful, I would just 100% recommend that unless you can. Plus you have a bunch of cash to drop on like a custom solution made for you by some, you know, company. Um, but even then, you don't know how to change it, so you have to go back to that company to pay it. I just, I think this is a very solid way to go. Yeah, the, overall this is a really cool project. It took a lot of work. Um, it took like, I think almost a year of my life. <laughs> I think it was close to 10 months. Um, and then this has been done. I've been using it for a long time and it just took me a while to get the video out. Um, I have some big plans for this. Uh, if you're you know, new to my channel, you know, I build Iron Man suits. Um, that's kind of why I built this. The I, the concept was to build like some of the turbo machinery stuff on the fourth axis, and then I could use the fifth axis to build some of the bigger parts of the suit, um, which I still probably will essentially do that. Um, I'm, I'm working on jet engines right now. Very cool. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, comment down below if you have any questions, um, thoughts, let me know if you want to see a video specifically about that gear reduction. It's something I think I'd like to do, but we'd like to know what you guys think about it. Um, and yeah, bye. So we're underneath the spindle now. There's the spindle. Um, and uh, this is a cool part that didn't get filmed, but it's pretty neat. Um, this is a distribution manifold. I got the idea from, I think it's, I'm sure this, they have these on a lot of machines, but I watched a video about a 3D printed manifold for um, DMG Mori, uh, Mori Siki. We have two names for that company. But um, this is a, there's a air and then light. This is just, you know, LED light coming in here. And so I have some LED lights in here hitting my tool. Um, and then these adjustable pieces right here. So there's a um, distribution manifold for the, uh, air they're all these and then these are all my air blasts and this is pretty cool um and this is all integrated there's just two parts and uh it's all 3d printed on a resin printer and uh i like that a lot